he's secure in Intel 14 nanometer fab. Yes, of course, he's secure in fab. You start printing and building and building and building. You have to put it on until you want to. And then you take it off. It's exactly the reason the 51 percent attack is very difficult to pull off. It's exactly the same reason why, uh, say, Warren Buffett can't come along and uh, basically buy a stock by dumping it and making it cheap. Because what happens is the, the actor's actions affect the market, which then affects the actor's actions. So if you go and start doing a 51% attack, the problem is you can't just do it in one go, right? You're gonna turn it on. As you turn it on, you're gonna drive the difficulty up. And pretty soon, you're competing against your own life. Right. I mean, it, it's very difficult in practice to pull something like this off. And, you know, quite honestly, I'm not worried about it. It's a theoretical possibility. It provides for a great computer science analysis. Okay. Yes? So, we all know about the technological vulnerabilities. Uh, okay. 51% attack, all these others. What I'm wondering more about is sort of the the more sociological vulnerabilities. Because a lot of other currencies, stocks that we don't, like you said, we don't know how a cryptocurrency asset behaves, but I suspect it will be suspect, subject to the same problems as market cornering and you know other avenues of centralization that you've right. seen. So what what potential or what risks of centralization do you see, as Sergey pointed out last week, for uh, New so risk of centralization and, and kind of market effects that can damage a currency rather than social technical speech. effects, social effects, yes. Um, part of the reason I'm uh, fairly confident about Bitcoin is that a lot of these market effects and manipulations depend on either scarcity of information or scarcity of access to the underlying system. So you either have to be 30 feet closer uh, to the fiber drop, so you can get those two milliseconds, two nanoseconds of latency and get that high frequency trading in, or you have to be able to manipulate the market politically, for example, by rigging Libor, in order to really do market manipulation. The point is market manipulation works less and less and less the better the market works, because it actually takes that manipulation and turns it into market information and makes it obvious to everyone. So inefficient markets are easy to manipulate. Bitcoin is one of the most efficient markets we have because it consists of feedback loops that are almost instantaneous and completely public. We have never had a global uh, transactional market as transparent, as efficient, and as uh, clean as Bitcoin. Which, by the way, is why you can't make any money mining. So this is the bizarre thing. Mining is currently unprofitable, right? You look at that, what do you see? Do you see a broken market? I see a beautiful market. Because in an efficient market where you have very little differentiation among competing products, and the only co competition you have is on price, or effectively, you know, what you're willing to invest your ASIC mining equipment in. The profit margin you're able to extract in a market which is rapidly being saturated by new entrants rapidly approaches zero, right? And so in an efficient market, the early adopters make money, the middle adopters lose a bit, and the late adopters lose everything, effectively funding the early adopters. That's how an efficient market works. So the fact that mining is unprofitable right now is a very good indication that the Bitcoin market is working so tremendously efficiently uh, that it is it, it is uh, it is impossible to generate money from an activity that doesn't really generate that much value. Compare it to the eight percent of GDP that the U.S. financial industry extracts from the economy, producing an inferior, broken, and politically corrupt product. The only way that financial services can go in the 1990s from 4% of GDP to 8% of GDP today is through corruption. So those markets are being manipulated because they're not efficient. And so I'm very confident that efficient markets make that so obvious that it's much harder to do. It's not impossible, just much harder. Okay, let's see if there are any questions on this side. Okay, go on. So uh, I've heard people say that they want to uh, calm down the Bitcoin volatility and introduce derivatives and all that. What do you see that? Is, do you see 
calming down the Bitcoin volatility by introducing derivatives. Um, I do think that, um, that, that having uh, better, better options capabilities and ability to do uh, hedging, essentially, for future risk, is a very important feature that we absolutely need. If I'm interested in using Bitcoin for a large value transaction, and it's not instantly now, but sometime in the future, hedging that risk is very difficult to do today, right? So if I'm buying an apartment in Argentina, and I have to sit on that money for two weeks, oh boy, am I in trouble. Bitcoin is not a very suitable currency to do that. So at that point, it would be really nice if I could get a spot price on a future market, the locked in a price sometime in the future, and of course that will reduce volatility. But I don't see volatility as a problem for two reasons. The first is that the volatility we experience today is an absolutely essential aspect of a nascent, tiny currency that is being adopted in growth spurts all around the world. I think of it as uh, we're all in this little zodiac riding next to the US dollar Titanic. Sure, they have a smoother ride. We're bouncing up and down on the waves. But that's because we're in a zodiac. The important thing happens when they try to turn, and can't, and we can. So the volatility we see in Bitcoin today is an expression of the frictionless nature of it, responding to growth spurts and adoption. And that's how it should be. I'm not worried. The other reason I'm not worried about it is because it only appears volatile to us. So ask an Argentinian if they think Bitcoin is volatile. <laughs> so part of the reason I asked about derivatives is that derivatives can also be used to manipulate the market and to make money off that manipulation. Derivatives could be used to manipulate the market if you can restrict access to the market by business yep. or politics, right? So for example, um, in New York, uh, one of the jobs I have done in the past, this is a network engineer, right? And the systems I worked on were high frequency trading, low latency systems connected to the New York Stock Exchange. The, the interesting thing is this has nothing to do with Wall Street. The only thing that matters is how far you are from 60 West Hudson, which is nowhere near Wall Street. It's like several, you know, a couple of miles off the north on, on Manhattan Island. Why? Because that's where the fiber hub that goes into the stock exchanges, right? So if you could get two cabinets away, and, and, and what they're doing now in these high frequency trading environments is that if you're in a cabinet right next to it, and you're a cabinet across the room, you have the same fiber line. The guy who's right next to it has a coil of fiber on the floor, just to ensure that the latency is fair to within a nanosecond. Now, that's a good thing, because it, it stops that kind of manipulation. But high frequency trading and derivatives can be manipulated primarily in markets that are not efficient. Are they going to create more volatility for Bitcoin in the short term? Sure. Absolutely. Take another question. Yes. Do you see the fact that the Bitcoin is pseudonymous and not truly anonymous as a problem uh, for adoption? Oh, is, is the fact that Bitcoin is anonymous or is not anonymous? It's pseudonymous. It's pseudonymous. Yes. not truly anonymous. Yes. Uh, Bitcoin is not even close to being anonymous. Bitcoin right, is loosely pseudonymous. Do you see that as a problem for adoption? For example, these Argentinians say their government cracks down. They're trying to use it instead of tracking down people because they can track them by tracking their Bitcoin transactions. Likewise, people probably don't like it when their neighbors can track, you know, what they bought on Walmart.com or. You know, yeah. So, so anonymity on Bitcoin—that's a really important topic. Uh, Bitcoin is not anonymous. It's much, much worse than that. Bitcoin offers the false sense of anonymity without actual anonymity, which, which actually puts you in a very dangerous. Situation. Bitcoin is loosely pseudonymous, which means that if you follow perfect operational security, you may be able to uh, hold your identity back from a non-determined, not well funded adversary. So I would have such people learn from the internet when it comes to identity security and encryption, is that what matters most is not what capability the power user has, but what capability is turned on by default for the average. On the internet, we can see the parallel evolution of email encryption and web encryption as compelling arguments for that. Email encryption failed, and it failed not because we don't have the tools. I have PGP, I can send you encrypted email, you can send me encrypted email. 
problem is I also have a couple of master's degrees in computer science, and so I can't use PGP. On the web, however, what we have is that when you go to you know, ebay.com, you get SSL. You get SSL whether you like it or not. In fact, you can't do it without SSL. You can't turn it off. You didn't make a choice as a user. That security is what I care about. So the issue of how we do security on Bitcoin and how we do anonymity of Bitcoin is not about building technologies that I, as a power user, or as an activist, or as a revolutionary, will try to use to evade my government. The issue is, I need to be hiding behind a wall of noise. And that wall of noise is every other user of Bitcoin doing a much smaller scale level of anonymity that ends up saturating the network with anonymity. So in order to be successful in protecting Bitcoin security, we need to have, for example, something like CoinJoin inside every client on by default until the addresses are relevant. It's not a coincidence that I'm saying we're living in the pre-DNS world. These addresses are, uh, you know, they're horrible, right? They're a, a, a geeky curse that is turning people off from adoption. However, the network protocol, the neutral protocol underneath, like IP addresses, is robust. What we need to do is build protocol layers above it, like Tor, right? That allow us to obfuscate the origin and destination of those addresses. CoinJoin is one of those projects. There's a bunch of others doing the same thing. And again, what's important is not what the power user does. What's important is what the everyday user does, because that's who the power user is going to hide behind. If I'm the only one encrypting on the network, they will come for me. It's as simple as that. If everyone's encrypting on the network, they have to come for everyone, and they don't want to go.